Yes. Well, this man has been high on my list uh, to speak to for a very long time. I may or may not get recognised as Max Gorn uh, regularly, far more often than one I would like, even though he's a handsome man, but two. More often than I do as well. Yeah, correct. It is a fair point and he's had probably a much, not probably, he's had a much better career than I have. He is here with us now, not in studio, unfortunately, but he is all the way from Melbourne, the captain of the Melbourne Demons, Max Gorn. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks, uh, gents. I um, when I was over in Perth, which I'm sure we'll get to at some point for that month, I got recognised as Will Schofield way too much for my liking as well. <laughs> we're going to get right into that. I mean, who did it first? Who did it better? I know the answers, but we're going to get into that. But the first question we ask every guest, Gorney, um, yep. doesn't matter what they've done, and you've done a lot. You're a premiership player, you're a pre- premiership captain, six time All Australian, two time best and fairest winner. Two time. You, you, you are an absolute gun of the game. But I want to start with telling you I don't care. I want to know about your greatest sporting achievement, not on the football field. Um, Many, many guests across this show, we've heard Sean McManus was a pigeon trainer growing up. We've heard uh, Andrew Bogut loves his poker. We've heard Tom Tom Hawkins, a high jump champion in his junior years. I was an under nines, 80 metre hurdle champion. Dan, uh, I'm Champion sure bowler. I'm sure you can see the trophy on the table. Mm. Five for sixteen in, in an under twelves grand final. Yep. What have you got for us, Gorney? <laughs> What's your greatest sporting achievement not on the football field? Um, I, I would love this to be the part where I bring in my favourite topic to talk about in cycling, but it's actually not. Um, <laughs> yeah, this might or might not be sport, but bear with me. Uh, when I was fourteen, nine months, like everyone, they try and get a part time job. I got a part time job with Domino's Pizza. Um, and I was there for until I got drafted. In fact, there was a little bit of an overlap for a couple of weeks because my um, third round draft pick wage wasn't great. So just did a couple of little shifts. Um, but I, uh, Domino's Pizza Hut and Pizza Haven used to do this pizza making contest and I represented Domino's Bentley. Oh. And I got second in Victoria uh, for a pizza making contest. I Very tell you good. what, that is a. It's not going to take the proverbial cake. It's not going yeah. to take the pizza, but I tell you, it's right up there. Yeah, and I would like to talk to you about it because I and ent- I tried to enter one of those when I was working at Domino's Pizza. I was mainly a, yes. a dough boy. Did you ever get around the dough? Uh, yeah. So dough, well, technically, dough is quite the easy job. Um, <laughs> it's, you literally you just stick the flour and the water in the mixer and let it go. Uh, That's great. It's, it's a lot of. Um, <laughs> you know, bowling up and putting through machines. But then oh I did get on, God. eventually I graduated to the making, you know, the making yeah. arena. And yeah. were you on this, you know, because at a competition level, you have to weigh it, right? You can't just grab yeah. stuff, chuck it in. It's very competitive. It's, really? it's pretty, it's a big deal. It sounds like it's a big deal. So <clears throat> without boring your will too much, but a Supreme, oh. let's say it's a, it's a hundred and a hundred, hundred grams of cheese, 60 grams of beef, 30 capsicum, 30, uh, eight slices of pepperoni, um, so there's a bit to it and I come second because I nailed it was eight pizzas all, all up and I nailed all eight in my own opinion but there was my pepperoni alignment wasn't great <laughs> yeah. and not every not every slice had a piece of pepperoni on my supreme who, yeah. who won do you know the name who won no nah, someone from Hopper's Crossing uh, it's I'm not sure if you know where Hopper's Crossing is in Melbourne but it's basically the Jundalup of Perth <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Gordy's coming in absolutely firing shots here. We absolutely love it. Um, talk, talk to us about your heritage, mate. Growing up, uh, you've got some New Zealand blood in you. Yeah, a little bit of Kiwi in me. Um, when I say a little bit, all. Uh, yes. Mum and dad are both um, from New Zealand. Both brothers are born in New Zealand. I was that lucky kid that was born in Australia um, out of the family. The only one out of all of uh, Gorn and mum's maiden name, Ballas, the only one that's Australian. So wow. um, I thought I'd be a Wallaby fan and an Australian cricket fan, but I've, I've jumped straight onto the All Blacks and New Zealand cricket. They're just better organisations to go for. But um, sorry to anyone who's a passionate Wallaby fan that's listening. But <laughs> it's not um, me. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, they're Southwest Coast, which is um, which is a pretty um, quiet place of the world. That's where they're from. Um, I lived there for a, a couple of months when I was real young Tucker, but um, apart from that, just Christmas breaks. Are we always tall, you know. Like tall people aren't always tall, Dan. I don't know if you. know I that. thought I was going to shoot up at some point. <laughs> just just that. Were you always tall, Max? Were you always the tallest in the class? What's, what's the go? 
Uh, no, this is, I mean, one of my favourite topics to talk about height. Uh, I love, I can talk about it all day long. Uh, no, look, I was I was probably third or fourth um, tallest growing up and then when I was 17, I just went bang. Literally, I went from like a 195 centimetre tall forward to a 208 centimetre ruck. It was phenomenal. Was it always AFL then? Like, did you play rugby growing up? Did you play basketball? Uh, I did like the young stuff for rugby, like up until like 10, 11. And as you can imagine, 10, 11 year olds, rugby union, Victoria, that's pretty grim. Um, so <laughs> like, I gave that up pretty quickly. There was a little bit of tennis and volleyball around, but I'm not going to be one of those big shooters that says I had to make a decision between this sport and that sport. I was pretty lucky that football was the only one. It, it was, and you're having good junior year, but you did your ACL as a, as a junior, I believe against the Geelong Falcons. Don't know if you know, Geelong boy. Um, yes. I mean – it must be difficult as a young up and coming, you know, you go pick 34 in the draft. So um, even off the back of a knee. So you must have been uh, impressing as a junior before you do your knee. Uh, I, my juniors is incredible. I went from uh, literally nobody to playing at Sandy Dragons to being at Vic Metro within three games. <laughs> um, it was a phenomenal little rise. I had a quite a good game uh, at Eastern Rangers Um Played the Metro trial game, then the following week was a was the Geelong Falcons game, and did my knee. So it all sort of went real quickly. Um, but yeah, the Eastern Rangers game, I talked to the recruiters. Now that was good enough to to be able to slip into. That was the first pick of the third round, I think. I was actually the Freeman recruiter. I think it was uh, Brad Lloyd or Simon Lloyd. Or uh, sorry, I, that's bad for me. I, I should know who it was. Uh, I think it's Brad, but I also. Yeah. Don't know. So he he called me before the draft and said, look, uh, we know Melbourne are interested to pick 18, but if you get to pick 19, we're going to take you. Um, so I was ready to go to either Melbourne or Frio. Those picks came around. They were quite nerve-wracking. Melbourne chose Luke Tapscott, uh, which is a real household name for Melbourne. Well done. Um, <laughs> and Fremantle, the very next pick, I had my bags signed, uh, my bags packed, ready to go, almost ready to board the plane. And they, wrote, they read out Nat Fife's name. Um, wow. which is looking yeah, – it's probably fair enough. And they, they then called me back after the draft and said, look, we had him at, we had him in our top three. Um, I said, yeah, that's probably fair enough. I mean, the, the jury's out. He's a he's two-time Brownlow, but <laughs> is he a second-time pizza maker in the Victorian region? Probably not. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you didn't have time to be playing any other sports. You're too busy making pizza. It's bloody unreal. <laughs> Um, so you come, you come into the footy club. Do you look back at yourself now? I certainly do. And I think I think there'll be a bit of a crossover as we go through Max's journey with my journey. I look back back at photos of myself with no beard and I think, well, what was actually going on mentally? You know, I know physically there wasn't a lot of facial hair, but mentally, do you look back at yourself as that skinny bean pole, no facial hair, no, no trademark beard and think, oh boy, Max, you are a handsome, handsome man. <laughs> Uh, they call it is what's the modern word? Is it called a glow up? Is that what they? Yeah. That's what they say. Yes. Yeah, yeah, glow up. My my glow up is 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 a phenomenal change. I'm not sure if I'm necessarily better. I think I am, but because I look back on those early photos and they're pretty grim. But um, yeah, I had no facial hair. I could grow a beard. I just chose not to early days. Um, yes. And I had lots and lots of nice hair, in my opinion. But then it started receding pretty quickly. Um, and I jumped on it and, and, and went for the zero. Uh, but there was that little medium middle period, I'd say circa Mark Neal 2013, where I decided to grow both hair and beard. And that I just wasn't sure about that. That's the bit I looked back on and said, what was I thinking? I was like a real Josh Kennedy, like one size beard and hair the whole way around. Like, yes. Um, now I go the shaved head and the beard and I feel like that's me. Uh, fun fact, Josh Kennedy has one of the smallest heads in the world that's been proven um, that Josh right. has got a – Incredibly small head, so it would have looked weird with the hair and the beard. Gee, I mean, it's just – it's so – I just feel so much in common with Max. He speaks about that beard journey. Yeah. The recession starts. You start going to a zero. Look, I got married in, with long hair and a short beard. And then uh, – anyway, we're going to get back to it. I will just note, I don't know what glow up means, but Kat, who is switching cameras for us today, um, uh, young, successful young woman, is pissing herself laughing at, at, in the okay, background. Of glob. I don't know what it means, but you, apparently you, you're on the money. I'd, glob, I'd say you almost had a, the opposite of a glob, Scott. You had like, you're like this young, fresh face, like nice, lush hair. And what the fuck did you do? And then you, and then you just, you know, went more into a man. Okay, all right. Let's go back to Max. Um, debut round 11, 2011. Do you remember it? Uh, yeah, this is a... 
So three weeks before that, I was in the twos Magoos. I was I was playing VFL reserves. Wow. Um, we had seven rucks on our list. It was an era where it was like, let's get as many rucks as possible. It's slightly gone away from that in recent years, but <laughs> we, had, <clears throat> we had seven rucks. We had Paul Johnson, John Meeson, Jake Spencer, Mark Jamer, Stefan Martin, Jack Fitzpatrick, and myself. Holy shit. Um, so not just rucks, like literally, uh, like they couldn't play. Steph Martin could maybe play tall forward. The rest of us were literally rucks. Um, <laughs> So I was a long way back, but there was a few injuries all at once. Um, I made my way to the VFL team, played against Ben Hudson uh, when he was at one of his VFL teams of the seven he played for. Um, and I managed to play a relatively good game against him. And then they picked me to play with Steph Martin against the Bombers Friday night game. Uh, we would have been close to a pretty poor record leading into the game. There was a lot of pressure on us, and they debuted me and Jeremy Howe in the in the in the same game. Um, and there was some other guys that were that played in their first win. I think there were seven of us singing in the middle of the circle for our first wins. Um, so it was a pretty massive game. We won by twenty points. I missed a shot from the top of the square, um, which, if we fast forward to the end of my career, seems to be a pretty common trend for me. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I remember it so well. But imagine getting the debut at eighty thousand bombers Friday night MCG. It's it's um it's pretty special. And and you wore the number thirty seven. Jim Steins gave you the jumper. Uh, can can you speak to that moment and, and then your relationship through your career? Uh, yeah, I'm obviously very lucky um, that I got to meet Jim. Um, I count one of my biggest regrets, although not. Um, any fault of mine is I didn't get to meet Jim before he was sick. Um, mm. Jim, when he was sick, is an incredible man. So I can only imagine what he was doing um, when he was all, all, all guns blazing. But um, he picked me out. And as you're going to hear when I talk about my story is I was a pretty raw kid when I got drafted. Um, I was still doing domino shifts. I was, I was um, probably not your captain's cup of tea, which is quite funny how it's worked out now. But um, Jim saw that and he works with adolescents um, for a passion. He, well, he did work with uh, adolescents with his Reach Foundation and, and realized that I was a pretty different kid. And he just said, it's okay to do things yourself, uh, do things your way, do things the way Max Gorn wants to do it. He said, the person you're tr- trying to be won't play AFL, but if you try and be Max Gorn, you will. And it was music to my ears because I was trying to conform into whatever the stereotypical footballer was. Um, and I was struggling with it, but then I always had Jim just saying, "It's okay, be you. You'll get there'll be some bruises along the way because it's tough being you, especially as an 18, 19 year old in that sort of environment." Um, so yeah, that's I mean that's had nothing to do with footy. What I've what I've just said. So you can see what Jim was able to do for me, um, and then also to be able to wear thirty seven, eleven, his two numbers, um, playing the same position, um, and also I'm now involved in in the charity that he's that that he started. It's funny how it works. So. Um, yeah, forever in debt to the big to, to the big fella. Yeah, I, I can imagine, and also the, you know the perspective that you have now, right? Like at the time, you're getting your jumper off Jim Steins. You're a young kid. You know you've come off an ACL, and I can imagine what it feels over 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 roaring almost. And then and now, you know, not not that you've accomplished everything that's ever be accomplished, but you've done a lot in the game. You're captain of the club. It must feel like a full circle almost. It's. I remember the first day. It was we had an amazing draft class. We had Tom Scully, Jack Trengrove, who were one and two, wow. um, and then we had Jordy Gisbert and Luke Tapscott, who I mentioned before, who were both inside the top twenty. Um, so we had four inside the top twenty, and Steins, he was speaking to the six of us. Jack Fitzpatrick was the other one, and um, he said, "I'm most excited about this guy," and he made me stand stand up and. Here's these other guys, these great pedigrees and what they've been able to do throughout the um, the, the carnival for Metro, Scully and, and Trenners was out in South Australia and he just randomly said, I'm way most excited about this guy. So he made me feel sort of like I was welcome and I deserved to be there from day one. Um, yeah, and then to be able to fork out a career after that, I mean, I would have loved for him to be able to see it um, and I'm sure he is, but uh, he had an amazing foresight maybe. Well, what... what um. It was that around the period that that you guys had like Trengove was your captain and Grimes is that right? Were you were you was that around that time? Yeah, well, uh, it is obviously not that exact time because Trenders was just drafted. But um, yeah. I'd say when Mark Neal, either his first or second year, so we're talking twenty twelve or twenty thirteen. Yeah, Trenders was captain at twenty twenty one. Grimes he was captain at twenty two. They were co captains. Um, and we went back to back spoons. Actually, no, we didn't. 
we didn't go back to back spoons because GWS and or Gold Coast saved us in both of those years. I think. <laughs> do, do, do you like you know now being captain again? You've got good perspective on this. With a twenty twenty year old one year old being captain is that does that feel strange? Uh, it does. Um, at the time, I knew who Trenners was, so I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like Trenners is the leader of us first year, so of course. But then like. <laughs> that's such a naive 19-year-old way to look at that. Like he's, there's so much more bigger things to do than just look after the first-year players as captain. So, <laughs> um, look, I'm sure in hindsight, Nathan Jones might have been the man to go for straight up or um, we certainly, um, I mean, it's easy to say this now looking back, but James, James McDonald took off to GWS, Cameron Bruce went to Hawthorne, yeah. Jared Rivers went to Geelong, Brett Maloney went up to Brisbane. Um, so we had some guys, some mature guys leave. Um, that maybe we could have enticed to stay and and and, and, that, and that could have been something better. But um, the rest, we ended up getting Nathan Jones as captain. Unfortunately, it didn't work for Trenners and Grimesy. Um, but I feel like, yeah, maybe the wrong option was done. I, 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 I'm very good. I'm very close to Trenners um, and I'm very close to Grimesy as well. And, and they were the standout candidates and it probably means something for where the list was at probably at that time. At that age, yeah. were you were you ever thinking like, oh, that's something I'd like to do later, become captain, or did it sort of just eventuate in that way? Oh, uh, everyone! I from a young age, I kept telling uh, people, kept telling me that I had leadership qualities, or people followed me, and it, it, it just never stuck with me. I'm because I'm slightly extroverted um, within the four walls. There's always that element of people follow you, and. Um, for six years, seven years there, I was probably leading in the wrong way um, and not wanting to be a leader. But, yeah, I certainly knew that it's something I could probably aim for. Um, but I didn't know if I was any good of a player first. Um, I didn't know if I could play the game. I didn't know if I could play the game until 2016. So um, to try and lead as an injured or VFL player can be quite difficult. Now, when talking about injuries, you did second ACL 2012 You've had you have had injuries throughout your career, especially the early part. Do you look back now at things you learnt during that time, and um, you know consider that there was a maturity area you learnt, or or do you look back at it as missed opportunities to play, or how do you look back on the, those times being in, in rehab? Uh, I, I'm actually I feel blessed. Um, like I wouldn't change my career. I'm not going to end up playing anywhere near 300, probably not even 250. In fact, I shouldn't count my chickens. I'm not even at 200 yet. I'm still a little bit off that. So um, there's – like I'm – but I'm happy with that. I've, I, I learned a lot of lessons being injured early on. Um, not only injured, I played a lot of VFL football in my first few years. Um, but I would rather that as a 20, 20 or 21-year-old. I was I was made to grow up real, real quickly. Um, I, I feel like if I wasn't injured, I might have – Kept being a, 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 a larrikin with my mates. I was drafted to a place that was geographically the closest to my to my house growing up, so all my mates were still around me. Um, but being injured, it made you. It gave you that challenge. It gave you that challenge to sort of set your life up. Um, you had to get the right stuff around. You had to get back from injury, which is pretty tough, especially knee recos. Um, and I look at guys like Nick Nat and Lyndon Dunn and people that have done a couple of knees late in their career. I feel blessed that I was able to get that away um, early in my career and learn those lessons early because I feel like it's a lot harder. If I had an ACL touch wood now, that's a lot harder to come back from. Yeah, agree. Um, you know, talking about you know, being a bit of a larrikin growing up, I mean, this is a favourite of all people that speak Max Gorn, punching a dart on the way to training. I know it gets brought up all the time, but, you know, what happened? What's the aftermath? Like, I'm, uh, before you start, like, I've played with players that, Punch darts. This isn't. This is more taboo, I think, in the media and the public than perhaps people, you know, than in reality. I've watched one of your teammates smoke a pack of darts at a, at a bar once um, <laughs> uh, during we were, the season we after were, a game. We were not be naming who that <laughs> no. is. Thank you, Dan. But <laughs> what, 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 what's the aftermath? Well, as the person involved in that sort of media shit show or whatever, whatever it was, talk to us. Well, I mean, the key word there, Dan, is bar. I um, I did mine on the way to training, which is <laughs> a slight, just a slight little difference. I'm presuming player X that you're talking about was slightly pissed. I was um, I was sober as, so <laughs> mine was a bit more of an interesting decision. Um, no, I mean that just shows probably where I was coming from um, and what I thought AFL was, and I didn't really understand a professional environment. Um, I was nowhere near the 
a hardcore smoker, but yeah, I, I wouldn't mind a Winnie Blue on the way to training. So um, I got whacked out of me pretty quickly, though. You want to hear a couple of, like what to actually like? Um, well, when Jared Rivers was, was my designated leader, um, so there was nine person in the nine people in the leadership group, phenomenal size leadership group when I got drafted. James McDonald, captain, Brad Green, Cam Bruce, Brad Miller. Aaron Davey, Brett Maloney, Jared Rivers. It was Jack Grimes, uh, Nathan Jones. Like I'm still naming names. I could keep going. <laughs> More people were in the leisure group than not in that era. Um, and uh, Jared Rivers came and said, uh, "Can we speak to you post training?" And this is at 9 a.m. and post training is 4 p.m. So I've got a lot of time to ponder wow. what Jared Rivers is potentially going to tell me. And I'm I'm thinking no one's caught me. Um, which is a fair enough decision because um, I'd done it before and I hadn't got caught. So um, I just felt like I, it's not I your was going to get away. Part. If you get done on a white train, it's not your first <laughs> night. No. Um, and then they obviously, um, they set me up a bloody beauty. Our, our, our motto is whatever it takes, well, was whatever it takes. And Brent Maloney started the question and said, are you doing whatever it takes uh, to be the best Melbourne player you can be? And I said, yes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> which we're all laughing at now because it's it is it is quite funny. Um, and then he goes, "So you weren't having a dart on the way to training today?" And I said, uh, "No, I'm on the way to training. No, that wasn't me." And they said, "Oh, one of our, one of your teammates saw you." I said, "Oh yeah, that 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 dart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was me." And then I went into this this sob story that my parents smoked. I went straight into the deny, 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 which Bernie Vince once told me is. Um, when caught, still deny. Um, and uh, I went into that. I went into that mindset, and I thought I was getting away from it. And I said, "Both my parents smoke. My, my girlfriend smokes. It's hard to get away from." My parents don't smoke. They've never had a dad in their life. Um, but I, I threw them. I threw them under the bus to try and get a little bit of a sob story out of there. But that didn't work because Brent Maloney said his parents smoke and he doesn't. So um, it sort of got whacked back in my face. But to their credit, um, I didn't have a dart again. That week, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, they 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 scared me, which is what they were supposed to do, and um, I took some learnings from it, which is good. Oh, that's very good. That's very good. Um, I've been mean, talking about some, I guess, more serious, or maybe not. Who's the guys that take you under the wing as a as a young Max Gorn from that moment? Then you know, it's all well and good to sit in a leadership group and tell you not to smoke, but who actually goes, right, you have got enough talent, you do have leadership qualities. I've seen these guys, I've played with them as well. You need someone to really put their arm around you. Who was that? Oh, they they all at different times had a, had an impact on my career. In fact, every person I've played with that's come through the four walls, these headphones are annoying me. Can, can I pause and switch headphones? Yeah, yeah go for I it. actually think you probably can. It'll be fine they, by that. They, they were really annoying me. I mean, Gorni can't hear us now. We could say anything we like. Yeah, that's true. I've still got the left one in. Oh, oh, shit. (laughs) I wonder if Melbourne are playing in Perth this year. I haven't checked the schedule. Do I need headphones? When you guys talk, does that come through the the mic? It will come through the um, uh, speaker, the microphone, sorry. Does it look weird if the second half I'm wearing these? No. No, that's fine. Oh, beat. Here we go. You just have to um, change the input. Yeah, change the output. Change the output. Oh, output. I'll just connect these first. Are you just gonna you gonna let this roll or are you gonna Oh uh, look. It's for those watching and listening, yeah. Max has changed headphones. I'm not gonna edit it out because I don't know, it's not that big of a deal. I, don't know, so. I can I can hear you, so that must be good. We can well we, go. we can on. still hear you because yeah, great. Right, that's much better. Uh, okay. the question, they were do you want to just ask a question again or No, nah, no, nah, we're gonna we're not probably not gonna clip it out, mate. Yeah. All right, sweet. Good. So yeah. Uh, yeah, anyone that's walked through the four walls has had some sort of impact on my career. I remember uh, Brad Green wore – this is what an impact a leader slash an older person at the club can have. Brad Green wore these horrible green cargo pants, like literally the worst things you'll ever see. Wore them with thongs as well. But <laughs> I, I thought Greeny was trendy and Greeny was cool. I went to like – I was about to say David Jones, but David Jones wouldn't be selling cargo pants. I went to Kmart and brought like the best pair of green cargo pants and wore them to training the next day and thought I was just one of the lads. I was looking, me and Greeny were best mates. We brought them together. That's the sort of impact, like <laughs> that's obviously a lighthearted one, but the impact a leader can have on a young player, they just want to copy you in every single way. So Brett Maloney, his attack on the football, um, Mark Jamar, his rough craft, 
James McDonald, just the way he led, I still feel like a lot of the stuff that I am doing in my leadership is off the back of um, learning from James McDonald, Cameron Bruce, his professionalism. So they've all had some sort of um, an impact on me. But no, like Nathan, Nathan Jones is the top of that list. Um, he he literally turned me and I, I saw him go from a Frankston Bogan to a captain. So I saw a little bit from him, but um, he saw me go from someone who was genuinely not going to make it to um, now in my 14th season. Um, I want to note that down for later on. I want to ask something about Nathan Jones, if you can remind me, yep, please, Dan. Right. Um, your first five years, you had five coaches. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so Dean Bailey into Todd Viney, into Mark Neald, into Neil Craig, into Paul Roos. Wow. Does that, again, all of these are in hindsight, but at the time are you thinking this is normal, this is hard? Like, What, what are you thinking with coaches coming in and out the door? People do ask me that one a lot. Like I've had stability in the last eight years, so I've got a good thing to compare it to. But um, I was so young. I was so naive. I just – like it was, all right, another coach sacking. Let's go down to a press conference. Let's listen to them speak. Yeah. Um, it was just – yeah, it's just happened. Our captain changed every year. I think it went James McDonald into Brad Green, into Jack Grimes and Jack Trengrove into Jack Grimes by himself, into Jack Grimes, Nathan Jones, into Nathan <laughs> Jones by himself, into Nathan Jones, Jack Viney. Like it was, it was crazy. We just had change. That was, that was what Melbourne Football Club had. So um, I was naive to think that was normal. Did you, um, I, I assume that, you know, when a new coach comes in, a lot of guys are trying to prove themselves and, you know, you know, show them, show their, what they're worth and stuff. So people are always having to do that every year for five years, you know, it'd be, it'd be, probably a quite exhausting sort of process. <laughs> and they're all very, very different. Um, I'm not sure if you've come across Neil Craig, Will, in your time, but um, um, yes. he, is as, he is as unique as they come. Um, and if he where he made us wear our socks high, footy shorts and footy jumper every time we trained and we had to get written approval to wear any sort of skins or garments underneath our um, footy wow. kit. So he was trained wow. as you play, literally. Um, Todd, Todd, Todd Viney just wanted to coach the way he played. So he just wanted to belt every, everyone. He would be in his suit pants and polo ready to go to the coach's box and have the bump bag, just absolutely nailing blokes in the warm up handball drill. Um, Dean Bailey, um, I'm forever in debt to Dean Bailey. He obviously drafted me as a unique character at eight, at 18 and taught me a lot of life lessons in those first two years. Um, was probably just a man ahead of his time. He, he, his, his, his ball movement stuff that we were doing back in 2010 was um, stuff that we're still doing today. We just literally couldn't defend um, to a point where we lost by 176. Yes. Um, which actually goes down as an interesting day in my life as well. The one, the one, 176 or 186, could be 186. Um, down, in, down in Geelong, Long, we are. Uh, yeah, the VFL team lost by 120 in the curtain raiser. And then the AFL team lost by 186 and I was carryover emergency. What a gig. <laughs> <laughs> I, was the, I was the most informed player going into the next week. I got picked. <laughs> I mean, that was the week that we got all these photos and videos of the boys. Yeah, 186. Still not the biggest margin though. That was uh, 190 when Fitzroy beat Melbourne. Okay, what year was that? Uh, don't know. Don't have that one in front of me. That was the, when, when, when you know you got, the, <laughs> you got the deep dark music play, and you got you know some high high flying media expert talent, you know an absolute disgrace of a footy club. That was that one, right? You know, lose by a huge margin. He's like you spent a lot of time down the bottom of the ladder your first years at the, at the footy club. Is that yeah? Again, hindsight question. Does it feel normal then at the time? Difficult. How do you get yourselves out of that? Uh, the, I mean. Again, it could come down to naivety, but the fact that I, I thought we were a chance to win every game I went into, um, and I get the question now that we've been able to sit closer to the top of the last couple of years, people say, oh, you must be excited about this year. How do you reckon you'll go? I said, well, to be honest, I said we'd win it when we won the wooden spoon in 2012. Like I'm, not, <laughs> I'm either not the man to ask or every club thinks they can win it and every club thinks they can win every single game. And I went into games against Hawthorne during their – Three peat that I was, and we were struggling to win a game that we were going to win. So that's might be naive, it might be the way AFL clubs are sort of run from Monday to Friday. They build you up, um, ready to play. But um, yeah, we were down the bottom a lot. Uh, I think I've, I don't have a wooden spoon just purely because Gold Coast and GWS came in in the two 
really bad years and they didn't win a game. I think we might have beat them to win our game. Um, but there was a game uh, in 2013 or 12, one of the Mark Neal ones where we were down by 30 points against GWS at three-quarter time in front of 8,000 at the MCG. It was as bad and as low the Melbourne Football Club's probably got to. We come back and won. Um, it was an amazing uh, last quarter to come back and win, but I just remember Mark Neal getting booed up the, to the coach's box by the 8,000, so probably he won't, we wouldn't have been hearing it. But um, <laughs> it was. there's been some really grim days in the MCG when there's no one there. Um, well, there was literally no one there in the COVID years, but when there was no one there uh, in sort of when we played a Freeman or a GWS um, away from home, and there was less than ten thousand, and we were getting beat. It, it was it was quite a dark, dark place. You, you go through your early part of your career, have a lot of injuries, a lot of adversity, you know, supposedly. But you know, when you when you really announce yourself, sort of fifteen, sixteen, as one of the premier ruckmen in the comp, I think you were quite outward in the media and saying that that's what you wanted to do. You wanted to become the best. Uh, do you? Is that what you did? Did you? Did you? Did, was that a goal that you had to be the best ruckman in the competition? Um, I'd, I'd love to own this because it's worked out. Um, it worked out really well in the year that I said it. But did I actually say it? I said that I wanted to be the best ruckman at the Melbourne Football Club because we had, like I said, seven. Um, <laughs> so my task was to try and get on top of them, and then everyone else sort of took it as I wanted to be the best ruck in the AFL. And then it sort of worked out that I was starting to get a game. And then I, I remember I took on Todd Goldstein pretty early on in 2016. And uh, the commentary around it was the best versus the guy who said he wants to beat the best. And I'm like, like I'll own it because it's kind of cool. But, um, yeah, I didn't I, – I, I just wanted to beat Jake Spencer to, <laughs> uh, to, a, to, a, to a Melbourne jumper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Is it around that time the, the beard comes about? I mean, I, we've got to touch the – I can't bounce around it for the whole pod. I, I walked down the street in Perth, premiership player, 200 games for the football club, close enough anyway, mm. life member. I've given my footballing career to this. I'm a Victorian, proud Victorian, Geelong boy. I, I, I live here in Western Australia. I, I probably won't ever leave, very unlikely. Yet, I don't know. Uh, if if two people recognise me, one of them thinks I'm Max Gorn. I <laughs> genuinely think I'm Max Gorn. Gordy, how are you? Fuck off, mate. How's that sound? <laughs> do, 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 yes, you've spoken about it a little bit. Does this happen? Let's talk about the beard. Who was who was doing the beard first? You or me? Uh, you. Uh, you're a little bit of the inspiration. Um, not all of it, but a little bit. Thank you. Um, I just got to actually off topic and more on the look like topic. I just got a text from Jared Ruffhead saying that someone thought he was me at, at Glen Ferry Coles. Which is phenomenal, Jared Ruffhead. We look nothing alike. Nothing, I'm not nothing sure. alike. Yeah, he he said he was slightly insulted, and to be fair, I, I feel like I'm slightly insulted. So I'm not sure. <laughs> Who's the loser there? Yeah, I think I've had the glow up, as I said. Um, <laughs> so beards. Uh, this is another one back in that era. We started to lose a few games, and we were doing a beard competition. So I think it was the last one to sh- oh, the first one to shave got punished, or the last one to shave got some sort of reward. I forget what the actual. Um, the 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 beard bet was, but it was myself, Jack Watson, James Frawley, and nice. I wasn't. I was hiding away at Casey Scorpions, but Jack Watson, James Frawley were on the TV again, pumped by 100 points with beards, <laughs> and it, and it, and it got out that it was a competition, and the commentators just come for us, said they should focus more on winning contested footy than beards, and. I agree with that. When I when I have a beard, I struggle putting my head head over the ball. It's 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 pretty common. I think Luke Luke Darcy was the biggest one. He said, I've, it, "Probably because he can't grow a beard." To be fair, he looks like someone who can't grow a beard. But um, <laughs> they came they came at us very very hard. Um, so that was the first sort of beard experiment, and that was when I had hair as well. So I did like the Josh Kennedy full hair everywhere look. Yes. Um, and then I sort of came back uh, with my beard and did it with a bit of a shaved head look. Then shaved it all off in 2017 when I tore my hammy off the bone, thinking like I needed a change, and that was really. The worst. That's the worst look. And if I get a photo, I actually I think I've deleted all copies of the photos that are out there. So <laughs> that's a bad look. And then yeah, since that time I shaved it all off in 2017, I've 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 been beard strong. Um, it's funny you tell that story about the media. It was less the media and actually internally. I've spoken to John Worsfold um, post him leaving West Coast and 
going to get him on back chat this year, but he tells a story. He walked into a board meeting and it was myself, Chris Marston and Josh Kennedy. Uh, we started with a beard competition and then a few of us shaved and then we just ended up all having beards. Anyway, he walked into a board meeting at the West Coast Eagles and they were asking about, are we pirates? Are we, uh, <laughs> are we? you know, who they think they are, Ned Kelly? Who they think they are, are they, are they bikies? And Woosha, who had been worded up potentially by someone that that was going to happen, had come in and he had his laptop. He spun his laptop around and it was Bruce Dool, right? Beard, bald, headband. And he's like, do, do you think Bruce Dool was trying to be a – like?" and then he spun another around and he had like one of the great beards of all time, spun that around. Um, Johnny Gastev used to be a great player for West Coast, runner at the time of West Coast, spun that around. Just started spinning. And he's like, do you actually think – how players look influences how they play or how their mindset is about exactly as Max says, like putting your head over the footy. You think if you have a beard or you don't have a beard, you do it better or worse. I, it, it's, it's actually ludicrous how much people want to talk about beards, correct, Max? Unless you have them and then we can talk about it. If you're going bad, your beard's the issue. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a weird little touch. But if you're going well, the beard's the, issue, the, the reason why you're going well. It's phenomenal. It's amazing what this thing can do. Just touching on... On, on Chris Masson. Is is he cool? Because I follow him on Insta because he loves wine, cycling, and he has a beard. Like, yes. He seems cool. He's cool. You two would be great mates. In fact, yeah. we may have all already subliminally spoken about him on this podcast. Um, Recently. Yeah, as in, no, like this one with Max. Like yeah, you told right. a story before and we said we wouldn't name someone. We may have. Oh, right. Right. So oh, he loves Darren as well. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I've met my idol. <laughs> you, I, I will tell you, um, Masto, Masto likes his footy, doesn't watch a lot of it, um, likes his wine better. He sent me a text. Um, someone had named the top 10 midfielders in the competition this year, and he's like, this is a piece of shit. Who's on this? Didn't know that. He said, I'll give you my top 10. This is my top 10 blokes I want to have a beer with. You know who the top, top was? Max That's Gorn. Cool. Oh, yes, it's the cycling. I tell you, mate. Once you once you wear lycra, you'll just you'll fall in love with other people that wear lycra. It's great. Right. Okay. Here's your cycling bit. I'll give you a bit. Talk to me about your love of cycling. Go on. And we and we don't have all day. Okay. I'll go quick. I fell in love with cycling because of my knee ricos and a little bit of early days SBS uh, when I've got a TV in my room when I'm 14. Yes. Right after the R-rated stuff finishes, which is what SBS was great for, yes. um, was the Tour de France. There was there was Phil Liggett, who's the voice of cycling. That yeah. name means nothing to you, but he is literally the voice of cycling. No, no, no. I, um, I love the Tour. I will say I do love watching the Tour. Okay. Yeah. So that's where I fell in love with it. And then now I literally, when Stephen May's talking NFL fantasy at the football club, I, I trumpet with what happened in the Tour of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Uh, stage two last the last 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 night like I, I stay up and watch it i know what's happening in every single event so i love the sport i love the activity as well I don't mind going for a ride um that's a snapshot that's and, the and masto and masto will be very i'll be i'll be sending masto that clip and he may yeah uh, may absolutely fall off Ma- his chair masto's got a bit more of a body for cycling i, I doesn't it doesn't strike me i don't see lots of tall cyclists though that, long that levers like long of, levers mate no, I, I agree with Dan. I'm a horrible frame. Um, it's it's not – like I can produce amazing things on a watt bike, um, wow. which is another great tool to a football club, isn't it? They sort of came in around 2012, 2013. Watt bikes really got trendy. Yeah, there used to be you could just hide on the spin bike and no one even knew if you're working hard or not. Now you've got watt bikes and they show the numbers. And um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, no, I'm a horrible frame, especially when I, I love riding mountains. I went over to Europe and uh, over the – uh, off season just gone with Ed Langdon, uh, and we rode up some of the more famous cycling climbs called Up Duez and um, the Stelvio. Up not, Duez. Yeah, that was, it was amazing. I'm just, I'm not the frame for it, so it was really, really hard for me, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. Wow. That, I, I know Up Duez. I'm not yeah, a cycling yeah. fan, but that is, that impresses me. Well you, done, man. You said before um, you, you did your hammy in 2017, so I'm not sure if you were playing at the time of this game, but do you remember the scuffle? Um, during a, a West Coast game where Scoey dropped Clayton Oliver with the people's elbow and uh, <laughs> him down on the floor. <laughs> that was my first game back from my hammy. Um, wow. Yeah. Was that, is that the game Tom, Tom McDonald kicked the goal on the square? Yes, I reckon. Yeah, so we, it was the first time we'd won in Perth since 1922. Like it was crazy. <laughs> I, it, was, it was amazing that we were able to get it done. But yeah, I Clayton... 
he's still to this day, and I didn't word him up that I'm coming to talk to you. He still to this day says there was contact. So I'm not I'm not sure how much contact there was, but he says there was contact, and I got to believe my teammate. I will I will give you this. And I speak about this a little bit. Like we we came up with a strategy going into the tribunal because we challenged it, and we yeah. spent. I reckon three hours coming up with a word to speak about the contact that had been made to Clayton's <laughs> chin. And now, what was the word? There, there was contact. I will. I agree with Clayton. There was contact. Yeah. Uh, did, was it brushed? Was it um, clipped? <laughs> was it um, nudged? Was you know there, there was. We had this whiteboard. There's there's like you know diagrams going on. There's people coming in and out of rooms. We landed on feathered. <laughs> so my elbow feathered Clayton's chin. Yes, it did make contact, but it was it was as light as a feather, Max. Okay, so he went down. And to be fair, it did look like he went down easy, but when he gets up and goes, he hit me, he hit me, I, I, I think I was amongst it. I might have tried to retaliate to you, Will, which I – I didn't mean it. Obviously, you're my hero. Um, <laughs> but and he then got into a bit of trouble. I think uh, Damien Martin tweeted him saying, that's the worst effort I've seen on the football field. And then Colin Garland, who loves his cricket, was sitting next to Clay Oliver on the plane and said, oh, tweet, uh, how about you how, how about you just focus on making runs in Sri Lanka in 2016 or something? He'd just come <laughs> back with this real niche reply, <laughs> which was hilarious. <laughs> he then, he, Clayton also put, I'd love the interview, Clayton, actually, but he, he then put a photo as his profile pic. This is actually fucking great. Yeah. I'll piss myself laughing. He put a picture up of him of his head bandaged, bandaged up on, yeah. as his profile pic on Insta or on Twitter. It was fucking great. Um, the, following, the following week he gets interviewed we beat Carlton and Clayton obviously had a big week in the media and the press and social media and whatnot. And uh, it comes with the best interview and vision of all time. Daisy Pierce asked him, how did he focus on football and try and get away from the noise? And he said, I just listened to what happens in the four squares of the football club. <laughs> and completely <laughs> stuffed the answer up and he was so nervous. I mean, slightly getting better in front of a cam- uh, camera and a microphone. But if he wins the Brownlow at any point, it'll be one of the all-time acceptance speeches and I can't wait for it. <laughs> Absolutely. I bloody love that. Um can we move to 2018? Um, you guys have a – you have an incredible last half of the year. You, I think you finished fifth. You're a big wave of contested footy. It's sort of the, you know, real announcement of the Melbourne Footy Club, which I think was like the beginning. It's probably – if I reflect on on West Coast time, it was probably the 2015 of our period. We, we just had this – you know, you look like you're playing on confidence, playing on together, and, you know, your supporter base was right around you. Come to Perth. Um, 2018 prelim. Do you remember that that period, that final series, and what it felt like for you know some real hope for the Melbourne fans that have been starved of it a little bit? You guys knew you had some live ones coming in, didn't you? <laughs> you, had, <laughs> you had these young fellas who'd won a couple of elimination finals in Melbourne, rocking up to Perth. Jeez, <laughs> oh, we didn't know what we will get ourselves into. I look back on that 2018 prelim and realised that we were happy to be in a prelim. Um, the difference in 2021 was we wanted to win the prelim. So like I, at the time I thought we'd just come up against our match. Uh, we gave away a couple of stupid things in the first quarter and then the rest is history. But looking back, our mindset leading into that 2018 prelim was probably how good is this? We're playing in the prelim, like rather than let's go out there and send a statement. So that's, that's disappointing that we weren't able to get on top of that back in 2018. But because um, as, as we know, the, the winner of that prelim, went on to win the granny. So maybe maybe we could have uh, knocked off the pies as well. But we didn't have a Will Schofield knocking down Jordan to go in the goal square, so we probably wouldn't have. Uh, don't worry, we'll um, be getting on to that in a little bit. Um, do, do people say you've got to lose one to win one. Now, um, I don't think it's true. But we, we lost a grand final and then very similar to your reflections just then, realised that in 2015 you're just happy to be there. You're, oh, how good is this? You're in a prelim. Or how good is this? You're in a grand final. Grand final parade, awesome. Do you think? Is some learnings around 2018 and what happened there and, you know, falling away and being disappointed that helped, um, you know, three years down the track? Yeah, certainly. And the, and the experience of, of a away prelim. Like I'm forever grateful to be able to play in, a, in an away prelim. I hope I never have to do it again. I hope it's a home prelim for the rest of my career if we get there, if I if I get to a prelim. But to play in a in a 
footy mad state for one team, or well, two teams, but to be fair, I, I, I did live in Jundalup for a month and a half and not one person mentioned Fremantle Dockers, so I'm not <laughs> sure if they're there. They're, uh, it's a very strong West Coast flavour in Perth. Um, but it was like I was getting a coffee the morning of the game and there was police behind me joking whether to taser me. Like it was just a phenomenal place to be. The Pardon? place was going crazy. So, can you, then, can you and just repeat that? I'll go back to that point because I wish I did get tasered because it would have been a better feeling than what happened in the game. But um, yeah, they, they were they were having a little joke whether to taser me or not, and there was West Coast fans just rolling down their windows, booing us. Like it was a phenomenal place to be. I enjoyed it, but that's the problem. I enjoyed it. I should I I, sh- I should have been there um, to get the job done, come back and 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 have another crack. And then we went into a 2019 season, which again similar to your story, we we completely collapsed um, and we lost a few early, lost a few injuries and then all of a sudden we finished 17th. So um, yeah, the, the win one to lose one, it's certainly not that as black and white as that, like win a grand final, uh, lose a grand final or win one. We were a prelim, but we actually had to go through like 12 months of learning. So 2019 helped us a lot as well. Um, and then even the hub in 2020 when we were all over up, up in sunny coast for three months, all that stuff helped us to what we were able to get to in 2020, 2021. 2018 is a memorable year for me, as 2021 would be for you, Gorney. Uh, we win a grand final, dreams come true, my entire career is finally vindicated and all of that. But one of the most memorable and special moments of the 2018 grand final was getting on the bus. And I remember this moment, getting on the bus and, you, you know, <clears throat> you want to be present with your teammates, and, you know, Grand final, winning grand finals as good as it gets. And we'd done all that and we'd been out on stage and hu- huge celebrations. We got on the bus and it was almost the first moment of like, like, like just Second five, to five seconds yourself. Yeah. So get my phone out. Right, there's massive, everyone, everyone from your, you know, your parents my to, dad. to your dad to yeah. I don't know who else, anyone who's ever seen you in the public has sent you a text message. Anyway, again on Twitter, browsing through, just go for this, go for that. Highlights. Max Gorn, big tick. Never met Gorney. Still haven't met him, really. I've been played against him. Will Schofield is a star. And I I still remember reading that. And I was like, fuck yeah. Max says I'm a star. How good's that? I just won a grand final. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with a tweet from Max Gorn. I, I thought you might feel that, a little special about that, Max. I, I, I was tossing up whether to write, when I grow up, I want to be Will Schofield <laughs> or Will Schofield's a star. I went to Will Schofield's a star just because I thought it was a bit more to the point. Um, can we just do, I know it's a, the podcast I'm the guest but can we yeah. and I'm sure you've circled back on your efforts in, in, in 2018 especially the I grand final I think it's brought up a few times no, here I but please ask you, did you get norm votes I fucking should have I've like it's not expensive time on that I should have <laughs> It was one of the more phenomenal games I've ever seen. Um, Thank you, Max. Thank you for fuck's sake. I've been doing it for two years and no one's ever said that. Thank you, Max. No one no one respects the lockdown defender. I mean, Neville Jetta had a career of it. No one, no one respects him. Correct. There wasn't a con- uh, I, but- I can tell you, there wasn't a contest lost. Didn't lose one contest for the day. Didn't come off for a minute. Um, I don't know what else you need to know. To go kick three, but they're all from the midfield. No one cares. You know, yeah, you weren't. You weren't you weren't playing on the second ruck. You were playing on Jordan the goalie. Like you had a you had a fair out, and, and that's sorry, that's harsh on the second ruck. Who I would, actually Mason Cox was the second ruck at the Mason time. So Cox, he was, yeah, um, um, who was on on fire. Did they, they release the um, votes for that? Yeah, they not? do, and I didn't get any. Yeah, right. Yeah, so one of the modern day um, disgraces of the AFL, I would have thought. Um, so 2018, that happens. Uh, 2019, disappointing year. Uh, you become captain of the Melbourne Footy Club. 2020. What's is there? What's the moment like when you get told that? Uh, we were Goody come over to my house um, in East Bentley, and he was sort of unannounced. He he was driving down. Uh, on the way back from Casey Fields, he was driving down. He was, would have been three minutes from my house. He called me and said, are you home? Can I come over? And I sort of had an inkling that um, there was change coming. They hadn't talked about the leash uh, votes or anything like that. I'm like, okay, Goody's coming over. I yelled out to my wife, Jess, said, Goody's here in two minutes. And she, I'm pres- I think from memory, she had a, like a towel around her hair. Um, so she have wet hair. I'm presuming that means um, and <laughs> yep. she, she she had to she wanted to organise a cheese platter, um, and it was it was very rushed. And he came in, and there was um, I'm presu- <laughs> my memory of the cheese platter was like Twiggy sticks and Brits bickies. Like I'm, like it wasn't 
we didn't we didn't really want to dine goody. Like I reckon if he saw what was on the cheese platter, he might have went back and give it and gave it to Vines. But um, <laughs> I, I do, as you can see, I do remember the setup quite well. I remember, yes. and as you should, um, to be announced as the Melbourne captain, go down um, with names like Jack Viney, Nathan Jones. Um, and then some of the, the greats from back in the day, like a, like a Ron, Ron Brassie. Um, it's pretty cool to have your name there, um, even if you don't get to what I did get to in 2021. Um, it was an amazing opportunity to do what is a passion of mine and it is, and it is lead. Um, and I love, I love dealing with youths. So I love dealing with the 18, 19, 20-year-olds that come through the club. Again, that's probably values installed by Jim. Um, in me that I also love doing that sort of stuff and um, I love different personalities. I love how they work um, and I, it was a great opportunity for me to be able to be um, at the forefront of that and albeit I then had straight into a hub um, mm-hmm. so it was a pretty intense time to be a first-time captain. Um, away from my wife, I left my wife at home because she um, had to work down in Victoria and um, everyone else's partners and kids were up in the hub and um, I was trying to deal with all sorts of different things while focusing on footy, while being a captain, while missing out on finals in 2020, um, while my wife's been back at home. So it was an interesting year 2020, but the learnings, again, I took from that makes, has made me a better captain, better teammate, better husband, and now a better dad. Do, do you look back at that 2020 year, can you remember some of the all-player um, uh, Zoom calls we were getting on for like the PA. Like you just talking about that and talking about the wives. Like we pretty much weren't given an option. It might have been a club thing. It might have been an AFL thing for hours to come. We had a couple of specific examples where you know, Liam Ryan's got a couple of kids that need to be with him and, and things like that. But we didn't really have any partners with us the entire time. Can you remember how – does that feel strange thinking back to – like we had whole player Zoom calls and, you know, can you remember that? Yeah, and just before you, I can answer the question, just be careful. I've been seeing a psychologist three times a week to forget Liam Ryan's name. So if you can just keep that, <laughs> keep that, keep that out of your questioning. Um, it was, I mean, can we, can we talk about that, Mark? Just I'll go back to the question. But that, Mark, I felt like I deserved half of the TV because the, the, the effort that I put in, was a phenomenal effort. So did I mean, you see it coming, there. Max? I mean, no, I didn't see it coming at all. We we asked our audience, yeah, you know, what 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 questions do you want to ask Max? And I would say eighty percent. Uh, what does Liam Ryan's knees feel like in the back <laughs> of your head? How, how does it feel like being uh, scaffolding? I, I will tell you again, Max. We have a lot of in common. Um, Liam Ryan in the year before he got drafted, so twenty eighteen he got drafted. Twenty seventeen I played a lot of waffle footy. Did a lot of that during my career actually. And um, I, Liam Ryan, this is no joke. Took eight out of the top ten marks of the year. They have a top ten in the waffle. He took eight of yep. them. Four of them were on me. Four of them okay. were on my head. So, well, you're in a safe space. What's the okay. feel? Like? Well, first of all, I did them an amazing defensive like running act, like an off-ball running act from the wing to get to the position I was at. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I thought I was going for an uncontested mark. In fact, I got called into it um, <laughs> like I was going for an uncontested mark. In. Well, I, I'm pretty sure it was Sam Frost that called me in um, and it was Bailey Fritz who was on Liam Ryan. So they're both my hitmen. Um, and yeah, like I, I felt like the mark is made even better from how much I flop. <laughs> it's a phenomenal flop. Um, so Liam, if you want to give half the TV, uh, be my guest. I've actually, I've been posterized a few times. Um, the Cody Waitman got me last, a uh, couple of years ago. Yes. Uh, my own teammates got me a couple of times. Tom Bugs got me from Melbourne. Tom uh, Bug. Yeah, Tom Bug, uh, great man, Tom Bug. He's doing some great things in the PR space, believe it or not. Wow. How often have anyway, you that's, uh, What highlight. was the question? Nah, who cares? <laughs> what was how, how often have you watched back that highlight? Because it gets played all the time. Uh, yeah, oh, actually, in terms of highlights I watch back, the Liam Ryan one's right up there. I actually really like watching it <laughs> purely because I really like – my effort. I really like the fact that I was – what I don't like and I think he's a great man and we played a lot of football – uh, we played a lot of football against each other. We're from the same draft year. Nathan Vardy did give me a couple of choice words when I was on the ground. Yeah, he did but too. He's a great, he's, he's, he's a great man, so I, I'll give him an out. But I was a little bit fiery when I, when I, when I got up from the ground. So uh, fun fact, no one knows this, haven't told anyone, triggered my memory. 
Uh, Nathan Vardy got pulled up in the team meeting about that actually and um, a few people weren't happy that they gave Gorney a bit of lip. I, I personally was very happy with Nathan Vardy giving you shit because I would have done exactly the same thing as Nathan but the powers to be weren't too happy so you feel happy without yourself there. People said that when I reacted, um, I was getting some press, uh, some social media replies saying I would have done the exact same thing. I'm not, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not many of our guys take unbelievable marks. Cosy Pickett does and and will take one extremely good and I'll I'll suss out what I do. Do do um I mean you, you like a bit of chat on the field. I mean my memories of you playing against you or around you, not you wouldn't have been matched up that often on each other. You like a bit of a chat out in the field, don't you? Uh I do. I love talking to my opponent. Um, not necessarily like I'm going to get you. I, I, sorry, I don't, that sounded really bad. Um, <laughs> not, not, creepy. Yeah, it sounded like boogeyman type vibes. Um, not, not necessarily like trying to psych him out. I try and like just have a conversation with him, yeah. Um, do you remember – well, I'm sorry. I remember uh, uh, Melbourne, West Coast. We're playing in Alice Springs or Darwin. It was an NT game. And oh, so I've got some good stories about this game as well. Do you? Not the game. I've got great stories about after the game. Do you? But continue. What's your story? Oh, okay. Well, mine is just uh, – I just remember Gov coming in at halftime or something like that. And Gov likes a chat too. So Gov and you, I see you, similar people, um, very good footballers but also good sense of humour. I've, I've also jumped on the low-carb beers as well. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Do you own any beer companies? Because not many people know that was Gov was a part owner in that uh, beer. So he's done oh, He's a smart man. I knew he didn't cut out the the, the, the full strengths. Oh, shit, though. No, he's been on the full strength all year. Um, <laughs> it was a plug. He came in and said, um, "Yeah, like, you should have heard what Gorney said to me. He said, oh, he's, you know, I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him. He goes, <laughs> he reckons you go – you're just not quite there, are you, Gov? You're just not quite there, mate. And I think he ended up winning all Australian that year. <laughs> I think we, you know, when they, uh, the best player of the team tends to be targeted. I think yes. Gov was our target, and we met, we had someone playing a forward defensive role on him. And obviously, then we get shown the flaws of Gov. So I'm watching all week his weaknesses. So then I go out game day going, oh, he's not going to do that. He, but really, like, these weaknesses is like a four, like four clips. Like, that's it. That's, yes. that's for, from the whole year. Um, so, yeah, th- it's a good thing footy does is they humanise the star to make them seem like they're not actually a star. Um, what what, so, what yeah, happened after the game? What, 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 what you- I, I, we got really close to you. I think we got within 20 points um, or 30 points and you guys went on to play in the granny or were – I think it was 2015. So Must have been, yeah. You guys were good and, and we weren't as good. Um, but we got really, really close to you. I feel like 20 points or three goals, and we partied that night to like, like we won the flag. It was phenomenal. <laughs> like, there's a there's a nightclub called Discovery in Darwin, and we were there till 5 a.m. And I was like at 3 a.m. All right, we got a plane to catch this. And but now our, our captain's in there going like this, like rocking the place out. I'm like, <laughs> we got yeah, we we got within three goals of West Coast. Let's let, let's go crazy. <laughs> Unfortunately, I know Discovery too well. We've had two footy trips in Darwin and um, one time we walked past and Timmy Trumpet was playing there that night. Fair to say, we may have been there well past 5 a.m. It was a good night. Uh, where am I up to? 2021. I feel like that's a big year in your career. Um, they've put – there have been documentaries out and I think Melbourne put one out and, and sort of seen all after the fact. But when you're in that moment in 2021, um, I think people talk about culture a lot and, and um, you know – Melbourne hadn't had success, um, hadn't won a grand final in 57 years. But, you know, e- even to that fact, h- how do you, before you've won that premiership, how do you go about chasing that that successful culture? Uh, yeah, there was – I mentioned our hub. Our hub uh, was very unique. We took a lot out of our hub and we see it as um, – like, so 2020 I'm talking is a big stepping stone to where we got to in 2021 and – um, I've spoken about this one a little bit. Like, there's all sorts of things that happen in a football club to be able to get to us to the position we got to in 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 that year. But um, there was certainly some aspects that we weren't over the moon about, or potentially holding us back. And we had one of those player in meetings that I'm no doubt will you did every year in your career as well, where you, you throw some values up on the up on the whiteboard. Some of them are just words. Some of them mean a little bit more to you. Um, and we, I personally went in thinking maybe the same thing was going to happen again. But 
Um, we got to know each other a whole lot more in 2020. We got to realize how bad it was that we were missing finals again and again and again. And 2020 was another um, case of that where we come ninth. In fact, 2017, you guys had to beat uh, Adelaide by less than 26 and you beat them by 27 and that kicked us out of the finals. And then you guys um, went on and did your Luke Shuey goal after the siren. Yes. Um, fast forward back to my story. Um <laughs> So we one of the things that got brought up was the way we speak to each other professionally. Um, and I'm all for banter. I love banter. We've been bantering for half of this episode, half serious, half banter. And, and, and banter in a football club is great. But when banter comes in and it goes over that line to banter about someone's job, I felt like that's the piece we were missing. So the example I use is – um, Jake Jake Lever. Jake Lever could take ten opposition marks, ten kicks from an op, uh, oppo it's, kicks, oppo marks, whatever they call yeah. it, in, 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 intercept marks. He's never played back in his life. That's why he doesn't. <laughs> <know. laughs> and that's like that's the pinnacle. Ten mark oppo. It's like he has literally played the pinnacle of an intercept defender. Like that's three votes. But bef- like he so he's sky high. He's at ten. But before he even gets to the change rooms, we would bring him down by like saying, oh, he didn't even play on anyone or I could have done that if I played on no one or something like 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 that. Yes. So we got this guy at 10 and we bring him to seven for, for no reason just to get a laugh before friends, before family, before journos can get to him. We've just brought him to seven out of our own accord. Like how's that helpful? How's that going to get us to where we want to get to? How's that make us feel good? And and it hit me hard because I, I was someone that that – did it and and still do. To be fair, we haven't corrected it to a point where it's out of our vocabulary. But now we're better at pulling it up and having the conversation about it. Um, I'm incredibly passionate and I love running. And I running is one of my favourite things. And I missed my time trial four times last season, like four times. Like, <laughs> and the anxiety that I built uh, up around my running, I didn't want anyone to talk to me about it because I loved it. And I had players chirping at me saying geez, you're running backwards out there or would hate to do that 2K again and, and it was hitting me and then I opened up and said that and then we had the discussions about it. So when it's something you care about and that's learning what your teammates care about, like I don't care about my fashion, so get into me about my fashion, but maybe a young 18-year-old like Cosy Pickett does, so maybe hold back on him or something like that. So learning about your teammates and learning what they care about, I felt like that was a slight little culture change we needed. Yeah, so you, you got to know your teammates, right? Like you got to be connected to be able to do that. You, you can't just be walking around being the nicest bloke in the in the world to everyone. Like you know, like you said, yeah. it can be clothing for some and something else for others. But knowing your teammates was the biggest shift. You think? Yeah, like I'm I'm passionate about ruck work. I'm passionate about running. So that maybe they're the two things you steer clear of having a little joke to me about. But then fashion or my head, yeah, go right at it. Like I don't care about those two. I think I've had a glow up, but I don't care about my head. If you say glow up one more time. (laughs) (laughs) But this is like, this is just not just footy industry. This could be like, this is any industry. These are learnings I'll take for the rest of my career wherever I go. I own own two wine bars. This is learnings I can have with my staff, um, some people in and around that area. So, that was one thing that I felt like got us into a better headspace. But then what comes first, like the chicken or the egg, what comes first? Winning. We won 10 in a row in 2011, uh, 2021, sorry. Or was it the culture that came first? Was it the big cultural shift we did? Because winning breeds culture as well, although you do you need the good culture to get the winning. So the winning certainly helped. Winning the first six games, uh, the first 10 games, but the first six, including beating Richmond at the G on Anzac Eve, uh, beating Geelong at the G, like they're big, cultural pieces as 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 well what is feeling uh, you know coming into that grand final um any other year apart from a couple at waverley um has been played at the mcg been starved of uh success in front of your fans yet the grand finals in perth um did, did you did you block that out uh yeah i blocked it out and again a hub, a hub's crazy. The, the border over there is incredible. Whatever your government were doing, that's a, like we were allowed seventy odd people over. Amazing. We can't leave our house yet. Melbournians were allowed to come to Perth. Like it was phenomenal that it was all even able to happen. But we weren't able to bring family um, or close family. And and there's some ripping stories in there. Like Jake Lever's young girl was one week old 
and he's flown over to go win a flag. Yes, he's had the ability to go win a flag, but think about the pressures that Jake Lever would have been under and we need to get – he's a popular person on this podcast, Jesus. Um, <laughs> think about the pressures that he was under and we had to get the best Jake Lever playing. So the learnings from 2020 about how we dealt with that hub helped us in the little one of the month. It was only six weeks that we had in Jundalup, but to be fair, what I've learned, six weeks is enough. And it's it's, it's not Jundalup, is it? It's Jundalup or Jundalup. Jundalup. Yeah. But like, you fine. saying Jundalup is way better. Yeah, it yeah, should be I'm, Jundalup. Yeah, well, there for six weeks, which I've worked out is six weeks too long, but... Um, <laughs> House prizes going through the roof in June. <laughs> <laughs> no, beautiful golf course and resort. Yes. Can't speak higher about where we're able to stay. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't, it wasn't daunting because we were with our mates. We'd done it before. Um, we play Ivor West Coast on Frio early that year and had a little seven-day uh, sort of hub. Um, so, yeah, we're we'll, um, looking forward to it without the pressure of seeing friends and family asking for tickets and um, seeing – and if you had seen photos in Melbourne, like the, the place was decked out, people were painting their fences. Like Melbourne supporters were genuinely um, excited about what was happening. So that might have built a, built a little bit of pressure from if we were back home, but – um, I love that Perth experience. Like, when's that going to happen again? Who's going to say they won a granny in Perth? It's amazing. Yeah. No, it was amazing. Speaking of the hub, was it uh, Melbourne and West Coast that played the final game before they shut down the season? Yeah, oh, yeah that was an interesting game, Scully. It was. Do you remember it? Yeah, I remember it quite clear. That was my first game as captain. And um, we uh, half an hour before we got on the bus, we were all watching a press conference about the season being called off. Yeah. And then we – like, the border was – getting shut pretty quickly and we were worried about trying to get back to Melbourne and then we had to go play for four points. It was still for four points and you guys got us. Yeah, I was I was first emergency that game. Another another day set spent in the emergency list. So you were the were you the guy the guy there was four people in the crowd and you were one of those four. James Harms was copping it. <laughs> I was gonna I was like, I wonder if I have to prompt Gorney. I'll see if he can remember. So I was first emergency. How can I help the team? There was no one in – there wasn't even officials. There was literally the players and then there was the emergencies that, that the like, you know, medical staff couldn't be up there. Like they'd shut it down and there was four of us in the box. And I thought, like you did with Gov, I was like, who am I going to pick on? And I, for no reason other than he was in front of me, James Harms was my man. And I, sp- <laughs> I spent two, two hours screaming Harmsy like a – like if you went to the footy, a hundred thousand people, and you got those nuffies. That was me, but there was no <laughs> one there. Famous, so you remember that? <laughs> and, and you gave Tom Mickey the Bronx cheers when he got his first handball in the last quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Mickey was playing against Gordy, hadn't had a touch the entire game, and we sent a message. We tried to get a message. I think we just yelled out to the bench and said, "Tom Mickey hasn't touched it. Get him a touch. Get a fucking touch." <laughs> yeah, and he had his first touch, didn't he? He took it out of the ruck. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, he took it out of the ruck. Like oh, that's funny. Yeah, um, so. What, what's it? What's that feeling like winning the flag? Like, what's what's that moment when the siren goes? Yeah, I mean, you had a not a close game, so did you have time to soak it in? Is it relief? Is it excitement? What is it? There's sort of there's, there's two feelings that I want to talk about. One is yeah, obviously sheer sheer excitement. Like I've lived a childhood dream. Like as soon as the, like I was able to take like take it all in for some reason. Like as soon as it all happened. I noticed them bringing the stage on. Like I noticed um, all the staff coming onto the ground. I noticed all the VFL players coming onto the ground. Like I was, it was all pretty cool. Like I could take it all in. I had a, an on-ground interview straight away with Abby Holmes, um, and I, like I, I really lived out that ten minutes. So I'm glad I was able to do that because it's a pretty incredible ten minutes. Mm. Um, then the other, the way, I, and then oh, apologies to to Frio as well. Before it. we completely trashed Frio's change room. Um, <laughs> like, thank you for letting us use it on your Frio, but like, I, I, I apologise for what we left you. Like, you, they looked like some good placement TVs. Like, they were, they, they did oh. look really shiny. They did look really shiny. Um, but the, the, we got carried away, champagne, corks flying and everywhere, and um, we apologise. I think we did pay for it, so that should be all cleaned up. But, and if you didn't, you um, will be now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the call from me, media manager. No, um, they – so we had an amazing one hour in the change rooms because the unique thing we had is there was no friends and family, which I'll get to in my second part of the question, the answer. But the first part is it's just the 70 people that we took over. 
in the change rooms once we kicked everyone out that was there, like the journos and the people that had local family, and we're just belting out one of the best hour playlist songs you'll ever see, like Sweet Caroline, This these sort of tunes, just the 70 of us living our best life. And it was the most amazing one hour. I could have caught the red eye home that night and been happy with what I was able to get out of in a celebration point of view. Wow. I didn't, and I then went and had an unbelievable week in Perth, but <laughs> um, I could have. But the other way I look at it is I grew up watching 230 MCG games um, and – uh, for example, your um, granny in 2018, like you got, you would have run into people you would have known in the crowd. You're a you're a Geelong boy. You would have seen friends and family. Like I'm walking around off the stadium, and I like there was no one. I I, I knew absolutely no one at that <laughs> crowd. I would have loved to share that moment of past players with uh, my mum and dad who have been there for and literally the whole journey. Obviously, because they are my mum and dad. But um, my wife, who was heavily pregnant at home, like that would have been a pretty cool moment to share with them. So I look back on a bit of envy with that, and it's sort of driving me. Um, to want like those three people in particular to share that feeling that I had because they've shared every other feeling. They've shared the worst feelings with me. Why not share that um, that extreme happiness feeling? But apart from that, if I parked that, it was the best week of my life. Yeah. Closely followed by three weeks later when I have a baby. But yes, um, well, actually, jury, jury's out what the best week is on that. Well, I, so I, I, before, I, sorry, one quick one before we go past the grand final. I've got to ask, um, holding the cup, Pre grand final, so there's that thing about not letting the captain <laughs> to let go. What do you remember about that? Did you go in thinking I am definitely going to hold on to it, or did you let go first? I let go first, and I couldn't have given. I'm a. I hate those sort of hoodoos and superstitions, and I hate it to a passion that I almost didn't even want to hold the cup. But Bont, I did notice that Bont held on to the cup for a lot longer than what he should have. So I gave it to him. I said, "You can have the cup." I actually had, um, as you can see, I. Lulu Lemon, a, a, a great ambassadorship role, well placed hat. Shout out um, Lulu Lemon. Shout out to Lulu Lemon. They it was early on in our partnership, and they were driving a Lulu Lemon sponsorship truck of me on a truck behind the press conference. So I felt like I had the upper hand. There's like this truck <laughs> going around and me just driving around the captain's press conference. So I felt like I had a little win on that, but. Um, no, there was no the superstitions went out of the window. I, I I had been told that I had to hold the cup for longer, but I. I stopped thinking about that. Whenever I asked Dan to remind me to do things, he never does. But Nathan Jones, coming back on Nathan Jones, uh, you spoke about him at the start, about being a big influence on your career. Um, how, how do you reflect on his time during that year and then not being able to play in that premiership that clearly he, he had a lot to do with? Uh, yeah, we've got um, we've got some values uh, that I feel like are before mine and Goody's time that are still at the football club that have gone on and got a success. And I think a lot of them are down to Nathan Jones. And and one of them is 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 our, what we do on the training track is purely Nathan Jones. Like he trained as hard as he could every session he could, didn't miss. Um, and he has, has put that on the rest of our group. We're now a really, really hard training group. A lot of our guys don't miss trainings. Um, no matter how old you are, how many operations you had, you are training, like trainings to train. And Nathan Jones sort of, that's one of his key things that he's left on this football club. That's his legacy piece. And um, we've all, there's there's stories everywhere with grand finals. I mean, you would have had Nick Nadd and uh, uh, was it Brad Shepard that missed out, yep. I think. Um, we had obviously Nathan, Jake Melksham, Jaden Hunts um, rolled his ankle in round 22. And then um, got a, he actually got back ready to train for grand final week, but they just didn't do the the move, and unfortunately it was an emergency. So there was some 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 really good stories in there. Um, but Jonesy definitely he, um, I I say I've got a medal, and that's great. Like I've got the medal, but the legacy that he leaves is bigger than any medal that we have. Like he he got us to that flag. He did all the hard yards. He got us what I said. Some of the legacy pieces he's left with training. Um, Unfortunately, he just wasn't able to be there on the on the on the day. Um, I've got uh, just one to finish off on. Last year, just gone. I'm do two, so we'll take turns. Okay. The last year, just gone. The first season as a dad. Have you found that? Yes, dad, dad life. So that's where we just sort of left that. I was three weeks in between. He was born October twenty six or seven. I should know that twenty seven. Um, <laughs> so what's that? That's four weeks post granny. Um, so it was touch and go and the conversation obviously had to happen and the conversation did happen. She said, um, what would you do if 
let's say I am premature and it's 36 weeks or 35 weeks and you had to miss the granny and, and I, I, I left it pretty clear. I said, Jess, I've been training my whole life uh, to, to um, play in a grand final or to win a premiership. That's that's 30 years and to be fair, I, me and her made George in about a minute. So like the, <laughs> the, difference in, the difference in time between the two goals. <laughs> So <laughs> the 30 years just sort of succeeds with a tiny bit. So I felt like I was staying, but I did it lucky enough. I didn't have to weigh that up. I'm going to steal the fuck yeah, out of yeah. that. That's about as good as I've had. <laughs> I'm stealing that for every sportsman night I ever That's do. That's great. That is unreal. Um, we have spoken about Jake Lever a lot and um, I want to <laughs> bring continue. him up one more time. Um, he okay. kicked the ball to you for a goal after the siren um, against Geelong. Uh, I guess first question, do you think he – was he aiming for you um, and uh, how grateful were you for that to uh, to be able to – because that was to send you guys to win the minor premiership as well. Yeah, I I, um, I love talking about this game. Obviously, I kick a winning uh, goal to get us the minor flag, but um, it was a set play to answer that first part. I um, Especially in that year, if, if my – opponent was going to the goal line. I could try and tease him out so Ben Brown could have a one-on-one. Um, and that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to tease him out and my opponent didn't come. So, therefore, Jake Levy kicks the ball to me. Um, so, that that's that part done. But And then the second part to that is I've literally missed that shot 10 times in my career, five of them <laughs> after a siren. So, um, there's a fair bit of pressure on that. And no crowd. I'm hearing everything Tom Hawkins is saying. Like, he's letting me know about all my misses. He's having a fair crack at some of my personality traits and probably my head. Um, <laughs> but I was able to tune that out because I could hear Angus Brayshaw behind me saying, stop listening to Hawk. But now I'm listening to Gus, so I feel like that was counterintuitive. <laughs> um, and then I looked at the scoreboard as well, which is the stupidest thing I did because that just confirmed the position that I was in. <laughs> we were two points down and it was full time. Um, but I reset all that goal, yes. Um, the best thing about that day is – the story, like Melbourne haven't won a flag 64 years. Uh, we're down at Geelong. Like I've said in this podcast, we were 186 point losses. Um, we've had some to- horrible times down at Cadinia Park. We were down by 40 points or something at three quarter time. And it was to win a minor flag. Like that's an amazing game of football. That's the best game of football. Then got succeeded three weeks later. Actually, probably every final then succeeded it. But you know, <laughs> up until then, that was the most thrilling, like exciting quarter of football to then win a minor premiership, to set ourselves up extremely well. Like looking back on it, Geelong had to go play Port in Port um, and Port were hot for that first final. Like we probably would have lost that game as well. That was that was a big game to win. Mm. Yeah, very good. Um, I just got a couple of quick fire Ruckman questions to Great. finish okay. off on and you don't have yep. just one word answers, but, you know, even tight. Do Ruckman make midfielders look good or is it the other way around? Uh, midfield is better than us, a lot better than us. Wow, well done. We like we 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 got some cool things that we do, but like if you like honestly, like we're if you cut right to the chase, so I got drafted because of my height. Like I've had to learn a lot of my stuff. Like yeah, I'd like to think that I can mark the footy and at times kick like the, the midfielders can, but like Christian Petrak is a genuine star. <laughs> but again, that you could say the same about. NBA like is is Shaq better or is or is Kobe better like yeah true. who knows do, you, do I mean talk to me about Ruckman in general I mean why are you on a you know different like an intellectually different um, level to the rest of the football population you're all you're all the same you're actually all the same and, and for a while there was everyone thought it was stupid so like the dumb Ruckman tag but now. Yes as we start to grow a little bit older and there's more and more millennials in the world, it's actually quite unique would be the word. <laughs> um, and there is there is a lot of unique rucks. I mean, a lot of your teammates are right up there, Vardy, Tom Hickey. Scott Lysett. Um, Scott Lysett, yeah. yes. Come on, Dean Cox. Scooter, Scooter, yeah. Scooter, I think they call him. Yeah, Dean um, Cox. I mean, he's, you know, he's smart, but he's, he's Ruckman smart. Um, Nick Nananui, very similar. They're all, they're all the same. Yeah. You're all the same. There's, there's some, yeah, they're, they're, they're getting more and more unique um, is the word I'll keep using because um, dumb is the easy one to throw towards us, but I'm going to run with unique. Some people about- don't help us. Some people don't help us. When your brain and Bruce's of the world start talking, <laughs> I, I, I understand why that tag comes our way, but um, unique. Luke Jackson leaves, Brody Gun- Grundy comes in. 
talk to us about um, what you've sort of, I guess, lost and then what you're excited about coming in. I mean, we've lost – We've uh, yeah, you've got a good one there. Luke. Luke's a really good player, really good person. Um, and – I was able to win a premiership with him, so um, there's there's no hard feelings. I understand he's experienced Melbourne in COVID. Like I've, I would have left as well. Like it's he's literally lived the worst three years a Melbourneian could live, and he's Perth is over there, open with all his mates partying by the beach, Cottesloe. Yeah, why not? Um, so he's made a decision to go back home, um, and yeah, I'm never going to hold that against him. It's he was able to do what he was able to do, but Brody, I'm excited. Like Brody's like the 27 year old, 28 year old version of the 21 year old Luke. Like he's a little bit more older and developed and experienced, and yes. um, we're completely opposite. Like I'm a guy who likes to run long distance and work into games, and Brody is like this sprint athlete who like can out sprint Cosy Pickett, and um, so we're completely different animals. But um, it's funny that we've been going head to head for years. And now, like, I was watching Ruck Vision on him the other day. Um, there was me, Brody, and our Ruck coach, Greg Stafford, and we're sitting there watching each other do our centre bounces. I sat there, I'm like, this is weird that Brody's in the room with me. Normally I had to get that footage illegally. Now I'm, like, <laughs> sitting there watching his vision with him and we're, like, pin, like picking apart each other, like, with a real fine tooth cut, like, genuinely splitting atoms. Ruckman likes to split atoms and we're splitting atoms. But, I can imagine. Um, I can just it imagine. Was, <laughs> it's 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 a lot of fun. I'm not sure, like who who. Let's say Jordan Dugowie. I'm going to say he's your rival because you played against him in the granny. Imagine if he just comes and plays with you, and then you're all of a sudden your best friends. Like it's it's a pretty cool feeling. Wow, that's actually I had never thought of that. That is fucking good. I'd love to play with Jordan. That'd be fantastic. Love to still be playing, really, to be honest. But I'm here on the podcast. <laughs> um, social media, Gorney. It's time for this. We finish every episode like this. I didn't say social. I said social. That's right. I know you know about it. Um, big big segment in the podcasting. Room. I've been going on for about 10 years where, yes, I've mixed Schofield with Scotial. I mean social. Scotial media brought to you by the people. The people ask you the question. We've got a couple of questions for the fans. They want okay. to hear the answers. Are you ready to go? Yeah, that was a big build-up. Jack W. Walters. <laughs> uh, what sunblock does he use to protect that lid of his? Uh, I wear hats. I wear a lot of hats. And as receding hairline people know, because uh, I'm not really properly shaven at the moment too well, so yep. – I wear, a lot, I wear a lot of hats. Yeah, so respect. And I wear hats to train. And game day is literally the only day where I don't have a hat on. Do you get sweat in your eyes? Do you use Vass? Do you have uh, no, I'm not. I've never really. I, I, no. The answer is no. So I'll keep it short. Thank you. <laughs> Tappy uh, um, Seb Vanders. Uh, which Brayshaw brother has the best golf game? Uh, I'm presuming Andrew because he literally is better in every aspect in, uh, of, of life. Andrew is like the pinnacle of the Brayshaws. Um, and then it slowly makes its way down. Hamish is somewhere in the middle and Angus is um, right down the bottom. But um, Angus probably, in, if, I, like, if I take that joke out of the question, Angus probably is the better golfer though. Shout out, Will, the fourth and forgotten. Uh, Sorry, I actually – Will Will is better than Andrew. Correct. I know. We always put Will at the top. Uh, Hamish Brayshaw, uh, a big part of our other back chat podcast that we do. Um, Tappy95. How does Big Gorney like his eggs cooked? Sincerely, the egg man. I actually go to like, – working in hospitality, I like to let – like I like uh, anyone serving you to work. Like I, I, I like the idea of – what do you recommend? Like, what's on the menu? Every time I get eggs at a cafe, I say, surprise me. Um, I'm happy with hard boiled, scrambled, fried, or poached. And it really is a great way to start your mornings. You don't know what's coming. They usually pick scrambled. For some reason, they all think scrambled's like the fun one. Um, Are you joking? Uh, yeah. or you actually order, surprise me. Surprise me. I do not care what egg comes out of my plate. <laughs> that is fucking hilarious. <laughs> Once again, I'm probably going to steal that because I can never make my mind up. <laughs> um, the bottom one, probably a nice little segue Riley J. Nelson. Okay. Uh, you own a couple of restaurants and bars. How did you get into hospitality and what do you love about it? Uh, yeah, little plugs, East End Wine Bar in Camberwell. Uh, that was my first little um, step into hospitality uh, and it's a great little venue. Uh, and then we've gone into a bit of the restaurant game and opened up another wine bar restaurant called Moda in Hawthorne. Um, I know what you're saying, Camwell, Hawthorne. I know my niche, Melbourne supporters, yes. Um, they're all in and around that area. Um, in fact, I'm in the in and around that area as well, so I don't know uh, what I'm saying. But uh, hospitality is more what I'm interested in. I love wine, but not. I wouldn't call myself a connoisseur. 
Um, but I am a big hospo man purely from my mum. My mum has been in the hospo her whole career and I, I'm sure you guys are the same. Whatever your parents do when you're young, you feel like that's like the, the dream job, like that's like the highest level you can get to in life, no matter if they're at the bottom end or at the top end, like they could be the prime minister or they could be a, a lollipop lady crossing the road. That is literally the pinnacle yes. and my mum, I felt like hospitality was the pinnacle. It's not. Hospitality is a, a horrible job at, at times. It's like my mum is uh, almost retired at 60 and she's completely and utterly cooked. Like <laughs> it can be – it's a it's a pretty tough job, but she hero, – heroized it? Heroized it? What is it? I don't, I'm, I don't even know how to correct I'm happy, it. Whatever you say is good. I'm, I'm happy with that and that's where I've led into. Do, 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 you, haven't, you haven't got her um, – on the pots and pans down at your venues, have you? You haven't got mum still working for you? No, she um, she actually, she obviously worked incredibly long hours. She was like a 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. type person, but she'd uh, get home at 3 p.m. and she wouldn't cook us dinner because she was completely cooked. So um, everyone goes, oh, what's it like having your mum as a chef? And I'm like, it's genuinely horrible. Like I'd burnt cookies because she couldn't sell them and she didn't cook dinner. <laughs> so, and actually mum, I've got to be kidding. Mum listens and watches almost everything I do. So hi, mum. Well, once You're again, another thing. Like, hello. What's my, what's my, oh, wait, 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 wait. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Hello, Sandra. Sandra. Hello, Sandra. Sandra. Sandra Gorn and Rob is, is dead. Yes. Rob, hello, Rob. Rob and Sandra. And hello, Jan, my mum, because she'll be listening. And Diane. Hello, Diane. Yep. And hello, Nina. Dino. What did I say, Nino? That's an Italian man. Dino is the Greek man. Um, hello, Dino. Now, to finish up, mate, this is the last one. Uh, I feel yep. like we should finish on this one. Uh, it is Slayer 453. Slayer. So. Um, has his own podcast. Gus and Gorney, is it coming back? Uh, thanks for the question, Slayer 453. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I feel like I want to use that as my Call of Duty name or something. I, yes. So, yes. Am I, is that how you say it? I'm not a Call of Duty man. Um, I actually, my I was a FIFA man and on Xbox, my gamer tag was uh, Big Macs but spelt like a Big Mac. I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> that is good. Yeah, What's is. A Dan, yeah. now, we're both gamers. What, what was yours? Squadron Dan? 7. Squadron 7, you reckon? Yep. Mine was um, Spangfield because – when I first started gaming, my my uh, my roommate was Matt Spanger, and we only had one account between us, so we combined <laughs> the two. Spangfield, yeah. <laughs> um, Gus and Gorney is uh, after some big conversations. We actually had a, a meeting during the week. Um, like I was happy to throw it up a few different names, get some different guys in there because it's a club run podcast. But um, Gus and Gorney will 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 come back, but we're sort of like doing some planning this year and seeing if we can get some big guests. And Gus, no joke, this is what I'm dealing with. This is Angus Brayshaw. He comes into the meeting and my guests were like, let's get Nathan Jones, Daisy Pierce, David Neitz. Like I'm probably not aiming too high, but I'm aiming realistic. And Gus has got Elon Musk and then he said, just in case that's too far right, I've got Greta Thunberg to back it up the next week with too far left. <laughs> and then he's gone with the Hemsworth brothers because they're Western Bulldogs fans so we can get them in because they'll love footy. And then he said, well, after Hemsworth, you might as well get Miley Cyrus in to even that out. I was a phenomenal – I'm like <laughs> – And he was genuinely – <laughs> He was genuinely serious. He was serious. I'm like, okay, so – if you want to listen to Gus and Gordon, you want to hear from uh, Elon Musk straight into Greta Thunberg. We might even get them on at the same time. Oh, look, Gus and Gordon is your get, way to go. If you don't get Elon, you don't get Miley. I'm always here, mate. If you want to have a rival on, I would love to have a chat on the Gus and Gordon. And and I know the response is not really, mate. We've already had a chat. <laughs> I'd love to interview you about your career. Um, yeah, it would be uh, going 2018 grand final very well. Good, thanks. Cheers. All the best. <laughs> um, I hope you've had fun, Gordon, mate. We really appreciate it. We know you're a dad. Um, you got the kids in the background. We appreciate your time. Good luck in the season. I hope the uh, injuries sort themselves this preseason. We're looking forward to you uh, combining with Brody Grundy in uh, 2023 and hopefully a premiership for the Melbourne Demons. Thanks for your time, mate. Thank you. I, not even I know how me and Brody are going to work, but I'm excited to see it. Social media, you can find us, backchat double underscore. You can uh, send us an email, hello at backchatpodcast.com.au. Sign up as a Patreon. You can become a patron, VIP, huge stuff over there, especially from our partners, our supporters, Whippersnapper Whiskey, Margot River Roasting Co., Blue Bet, Shelter Brewing Co., and, of course, Leadable Cameras. Get over there, everything you know, backchatpodcast.com.au. We're done, we're dusted. Go on to get the kids. We're finished.